Uh, thanks for to all of you who are still here. Uh, uh, you will be treated with many exciting talks and also uh, from the various um, departments uh, in STEM. So the first um, talk will be delivered by Professor Barbara so Ozilamas. I hope I pronounced his last name correctly. Um, Professor Barbara, uh, it is the he is the head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Um, he is globally recognized as a highly prolific researcher and inventor in a wide range of material systems and device applications. Uh, his current focus is on accelerating the widespread adoption of graphene and other 2D materials in, into industry. He's also the founder of Graphene Skill Private Limited, uh, an US spin off commercializing graphene for the use in uh, supercapacitors, semiconductors, heat assisted magnetic recording, uh, and also in biomedical application. Today, uh, he'll be talking about the 2D, his 2D, the 2D material, material materials adventure, a journey from basic scientific discovery to deep tech value capture. Again, um, it's a, uh, please feel free to ask questions in Q&A panel. Uh, it's a very interactive talk, okay? Um, Professor Barbaros, uh, take it away, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and I'm super excited to talk to all the young people here. So let me first then uh, share the screen. Is that um, okay? Um, what happened? Yeah, oh. okay. Uh, Is it, hold on. What am I sharing actually now? You're sharing everything. <laughs> okay, that's okay, not what that's I, okay too. Yeah. <laughs> give, me, give me a second. Uh, I want to share this one. Is this the presentation now? I actually can't. Um, no, we can see your slides. I mean, the whole thing. Is that now the I slide? Then? Yeah. I think okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you should see now my first slide if that is uh, the right screen. It's correct. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, I'm I'm by training a physicist, so I got my PhD in physics. But I was always very interested in, in material science and uh, the technical term for that is condensed matter physics. And over the years, I ended up sort of venturing into things which took me a bit off course. When I look back, what I was super excited as a student, it was about um, making big discoveries uh, in the area of physics. But during my own journey as a scientist, I realized that uh, the basic discovery is many times driven by very specific challenges in society and industry. So by trying to solve a technological problem, one ends up actually making often a big discovery. Um, and, and this is a journey which you cannot just uh, plan ahead you sort of have to be open-minded and you start on your journey and as you progress you will be given by nature opportunities to make a big discovery uh, as long as you are persistent and open-minded and enjoy the journey there are plenty of opportunities to really make your mark and uh, to make your own discovery so in this talk i wanted to give you a bit of uh, background about my own journey and uh, and I, I and also share with you a, a, a group of discoveries and material systems which have been really the focus of condensed matter physics over the last two plus decades. Um, so the material I'm excited about is called graphene. Um, so I want to first share with you what graphene is, how it was discovered and what the big deal is about graphene. And then, uh, switch over uh, to what currently I'm trying to do with this material. Um, and really the big message is you don't really need to know from the beginning where the journey is going to take you. Uh, you will really make amazing discoveries and you will have a lot of fun uh, as long as you sort of find the right team, of course, but also as long as you are not too focused on getting a specific result. One needs to be really a bit more open-minded when one looks at a PhD program and, and, and be ready for discoveries when opportunities arise. Okay, so what is graphene? So graphene consists of carbon atoms, 
which are arranged uh, in, a, in a hexagonal pattern. Think of a chicken wire mesh, a hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms. And the uniqueness of this is that it's only one atom thick. It's a free-stranding sheet of carbon atoms, but they're incredibly strongly bonded to each other. And because of the specific arrangement of these carbon atoms in this hexagonal, hexagonal pattern, um, this gives rise to uh, a very surprising uh, properties, both in terms of its mechanical properties, its electronic properties, its thermal properties. And because uh, these uh, new properties are so unique, they find a lot of potential applications uh, in our everyday life, okay? So it is also considered the building block of any carbon-based material in many ways. If you just look at the crystalline materials, you have one sheet of graphene, you could cut it up in a way and roll it into a cylinder. You could stack these to create graphite. The cylinder would be the carbon nanotube, but you can also make them into buckyballs. These are cylindrically shaped hexagonal carbon uh, uh, balls essentially. Um, so it is very versatile in terms of creating new structures when you start off with a two-dimensional sheet. Um, so this is a bit of physics, so don't get um, you know, um, too worried about that. This is going to be maybe too deep into physics. All I wanna share with you is that this kind of material gives rise to a specific type of electron. So electrons are manifestations of excitations in a material um, and they can be charged um, positive or negative. In graphene, the landscape in which this electron moves happens to be very special. And the electrons take this landscape as a, as a cue to behave as if they were relativistic particles. And the nature of this relativistic behavior uh, in the early days uh, made us dream a bit of experiments we could do with these uh, material, which you usually would only see in particle accelerators, for example. Because the electrons behave as if they were relativistic, uh, new ideas came up in how to use something you can make at home to mimic some of the physics and science in particle accelerators, in neutrino detectors, etc. So I'm going to just briefly mention to you that this is really an exceptional material because it's much more conducting uh, then, for example, copper wires, it is definitely a lot more conducting than any semiconductor. It is the world's strongest material we know so far, but yet it's flexible. Um, and although it's only one layer thick, it's impermeable to any gas, including helium, which is usually leaking through any barrier you may have. And, and it is a relativistic particle so the physics you can study is closely related to physics you, for example, are looking at in, uh, in uh, particle accelerators, in neutrino detectors. I've shown you two uh, pictures of this last vast uh, um, uh, experimental setups to study relativistic physics, particle physics. And yet you could do aspects of that in a, in a simple lab, which is here shown, for example, on the right-hand side, which was the lab uh, I worked in at Columbia University during the discovery of graphene. Um, so these are more specific examples. So because graphene is hosting relativistic electrons, then you can study, for example, something called Klein tunneling, which is a effect which has been predicted in the early days uh, when Einstein was still alive, where particles, when they hit a wall if they are relativistic, the chance for them to tunnel through the wall actually increases the greater the barrier is. This is something we cannot explain by classical physics. It's really a consequence of relativistic physics. And over the years, people have indeed shown that electrons behave like that. So if you throw an electron at a barrier, the stronger the barrier is, the more likely it can penetrate. And of course, in, uh, in the early days, there were also a lot of excitements about graphene 
because there were ideas uh, about using the electrons in graphene to do quantum computation. So, uh, and, and we, we tried to do these things over the years. Some of them were successful, some of them not so successful. And I'm gonna later on share with you what the challenges were in realizing some of the great ideas which were early on discussed in the graphene literature. Before I do that, let me share with you also that the two scientists who have discovered graphene, Sir Andre Gaim and Sir Konstantin Novoselov, were awarded in 2010 the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And that is remarkable because graphene itself was only discovered in 2004. And within six year years, the importance of graphene was, was recognized and they were awarded this prize. And I would like to also share with you that Sir Konstantin Novoselov is now a professor at NUS at the Material Science and Engineering Department. He has moved to Singapore about three years ago. So back to how they did this, right? So uh, you may have heard these stories quite a bit that discoveries which lead to the Nobel Prize happen to be rather accidental and they don't necessarily require big facilities but they require great ideas and a joy in experimenting and trying things out. So essentially, there were two teams trying to discover, isolate. One of the teams was at Columbia University where I was part of as a postdoc. The other team was in Manchester, Sir Andy Graham and Sir Konstantin Novoselov. So the American team did what the Americans are good at. They went really complicated, technology approach where they use sophisticated tools such as an atomic force microscope to isolate graphene. The team in Manchester did something a lot more elegant. What they noticed is if you take a piece of graphite and draw with that piece of graphite on, on a silicon vapor, what you do is you actually exfoliate from that graphite, small, thin pieces of graphite. And sometimes these pieces are so thin that you end up with a single layer of graphite. And what they discovered is that you can actually see an atomic layer of graphene on a silicon wafer by just looking under a microscope. And uh, so that was the trick because they were able to use a very simple tool and they made the discovery that you can actually use a microscope to see even one atom thick films of graphene uh, if you choose the substrate right. And that was the key breakthrough. And that was why they were the first to isolate graphene. And the isolation really took something like a pencil, because at the tip of a pencil, you also have technically some graphite layers. If they are thin enough, you can isolate them. It, calls, it is called graphene. But rather than a pencil, they use actually scotch tape. So if you think about it, a piece of graphite, think of the tip of your pencil and scotch tape and an optical microscope were what it took to get a Nobel Prize. Of course, someone had to think about how to use all this and why this would work and actually have the idea of let's go and discover graphene. So I'm going to just illustrate how we do this now on a regular basis also in the lab. So you take a graphite powder, this is you know, very common, you can buy it, and you take a piece of scotch tape and then you put the graphite powder on the scotch tape and then you press it against the wafer and you scratch, you sort of rub it against the, uh, the tape, uh, the wafer against the tape, and then you peel off the tape. And when you peel it off, a lot of fragments occur. But if you look carefully at the microscope and below in this row, these are all optical pictures. What you see is there are very thin stripes which are almost translucent. And after careful study, uh, it was confirmed that the very faint contrast here is due to one layer of graphene. So you are looking with your bare eyes through a one layer of graphene. And the slightly thicker contrast happens to be two layers of graphene. Now, you can, of course, not do much with it because it's just the picture. But once you know there is graphene, you can use sophisticated nanotechnology to put electric contacts on these graphene sheets and characterize the relative nature of this electron in graphene, for example. Now, of course, the initial discovery was very useful to study basic physics. And it's still, using scotch tape, you get the best 
crystals of graphene because you take advantage of mother nature which made this perfect graphite block over millions of years and you just extract a single film or single layer out of that bulk crystal but you can't make any applications of that for that you really need to think on how can i scale that up and this is in many ways the research i do in my own work so one of or in my own research group and one of our earlier publications of this or discoveries jointly done with a team of scientists that, uh, in, in Korea, some of them working at Samsung, was that we can use a very simple deposition system where you take methane gas, heat it up on a cup of oil, and through controlling the process parameters, you end up with a monolayer of graphene on a cup of foil. So then you go from micron-sized graphite graphene films to meter size graphene films. So we were very excited in 2010 about this discovery. Uh, and we were thinking we can now build very advanced touch panels for flexible phones and so on. Turns out that we are still lacking a lot of technological insight to commercialize these graphene films. And that's what I also want to share with you. It's like the, the process from basic material discovery to making use of that discovery in industry is not a linear process. There are really a lot of back and forth, and that's the exciting part. Whenever you, you hit a roadblock in your, in your effort to make this material perfect, to scale it up, to integrate it, it leads to, to other fields of research, to other applications you never even thought of. And uh, that has happened quite often over the last two, three years now in my research group. And I want to share with you a few more ideas which we are exploring. On that. So just to highlight the initial dream was to make flexible, foldable touch panels, which then can unfold. Uh, this was about 10 years ago. Some initial attempts were done, but the process technology is still not ready to enable that with graphene. Um, but along the way, we thought about other use cases. It turns out there are many potential use cases for graphene. So you can use it for flexible electronics. You can use this for touch panels. You can reuse this in semiconductor technology, but you can use this also in energy storage. So there is a vast range of potential applications. The challenge is how do you make graphene such that you can easily integrated with other materials and how can you make graphene with the exact properties you need for a specific application um, so so and that's sort of a new research direction generally speaking um, in the field of graphene and 2d materials to engineer this material for a specific use case now before i continue there are actually two types of graphene, more broadly speaking. One type of graphene is really a film, so it's still two-dimensional and flat. The, the other type of graphene is still something which is atomically thin, but you can crumble it and make it into a foam, where it is now a 3D structure, but when you look carefully inside, it consists of 2D sheets which are crumbled with a lot of gaps in between. So we call it therefore 3D graphene foam. So the 2D sheets are primarily used for electronic applications for, uh, and the graphene foam is primarily used for energy applications. And sometimes you can see both versions in biomedical applications. And really the big challenge is how to engineer this material with, uh, with, with a specific use case in mind. And what happens to be very important here is that you are in constant dialogue with companies and from them you learn, okay, how needs to be, how we need to make this material so it's useful to them. And this, this is about like how you can combine it with existing materials, how, how to change the tools of industry so they can actually make that in large scales. And then you need to sort of think about reliability, stability. All that information is actually not at the university readily available, but it is the job of companies to worry about these things. By talking to these companies, we actually can take advantage of their know-how. Um, so I'm going to continue now with four specific examples, which I am working on now with my group. One is to use a, an amorphous version of graphene for semiconductor 
semiconductor applications. The second one is this graphene form I mentioned for energy storage applications. And then there is a graphene version, which is not longer made out of carbon, but other elements. And you can use it for quantum computation. And last but not least, uh, I will share with you what we are exploring graphene in biomedical applications. So if you think of graphene, what I showed earlier, it was a perfect array of hexagonal carbon uh, arranged in a, in a crystal. Now, that type of material is extremely difficult to make because it's perfect. If you say, I just want an atomically thin film, but I don't need it to perfect. It doesn't need to be always a hexagon. Sometimes it can be a pentagon, sometimes it can be an octagon. Then it becomes a lot easier to make this material. And that, have, that type of material because we call amorphous graphene because there is no crystalline structure. There is no repetition. It's all random, but it's still a monolayer of carbon uh, and it is a uh, fully suspended uh, freestanding film. Um, and this material we discovered in 2019, and it turns out that these amorphous films uh, are extremely useful for many, many applications. So these kind of films potentially can help us to overcome of some of the current technological limits we have in industry. So there are three examples I want to give you. One is a semiconductor industry. If we want to shrink the transistor size, we need to also worry about the metal lines which connect to the transistor. Um, and the metal lines themselves cannot make much thinner, provided we can actually introduce amorphous graphene between the metal and the semiconductor. So it's, it's a rather technical discussion, but I'm just sharing with you that at the end of the day, sometimes technology is limited by something rather unexpected. And it turns out that the barrier films which separate the metal lines from the semiconducting transistor are the limiting factor. And here, amorphous graphene can play an important role. You may have heard in recent news, the shortage of uh, silicon chips, et cetera. So there is a big demand to improve semiconductor technology. The other area is magnetic data storage. So you no longer see um, magnetic hard disk in your laptop. But if you think of social media, if you look at cloud computing, all that data needs to be stored somewhere reliably. And for this, we still use magnetic hard disks. And it turns out that the amount of data you can store in magnetic hard disks is now again limited by something which protects the magnetic elements from oxidation. Um, and there we have hit a roadblock. And in order to overcome that, we, are, we need something like amorphous graph. Um, so this allows us to increase the storage density of magnetic hard disks. And uh, with the ever increasing need for more data, this becomes a really a crucial problem. Other areas for these amorphous graphene are in uh, displays. So if you want to make very thin displays, you need to start thinking about how can you make really nice barriers which prevent the display from getting uh, uh, oxidized, for example, or it reacts with moisture, the organic LEDs. And again, amorphous graphene seems to be really promising in this area. And we are working in my team on all these problems. Um, and it's a platform technology. So once you have engineered a material, you know how to engineer it. And then it's more like tweaking the, 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 the type of graphene to the specific need. So in many ways, it's similar to the story of COVID-19 and the vaccines, right? Once you know how to do this, you can adapt to the different variants quickly. Uh, the second area I want to mention is if you crumble now graphene and you make it like into a, a, a foam, a foam means there are uh, a lot of channels which are interconnected, a lot of pores. You can actually use this type of graphene to make uh, very, very sophisticated energy storage devices we call supercapacitors. And one area where supercapacitors are more and more important is in satellites um, or in the electric vehicle industry because you need to always complement battery with a supercapacitor if you want to save weight. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly through the rest of the two applications. So we are working with DSO and ST engineering satellite systems to adopt this graphene technology for their specific energy modules to power their satellite. Um, the biosender bandage with graphene relies on another type of engineering graphene. 
where you make graphene highly conductive. And that property of graphene allows you to make sensors out of it, but it also acts as an antibacterial coating. Surprisingly, this type of graphene seems to lead to stem cell differentiation, so which could increase or accelerate wound healing. So this is, of course, done in collaboration with other colleagues at NUS who are experts in that type of uh, research. So we are not doing this part, but we are collaborating. That's really important. And uh, last but not least, all this engineering work allows you also to think a lot more about quantum computation. It turns out that if you start to stack 2D materials, you can make this material a hybrid, which is at the same time magnetic, semiconducting, and superconducting. And these are important concepts to make more reliable, robust topological superconductors. Um, and we are very well equipped in my lab uh, to do this kind of work because we build an entire uh, tool set which allows you to quickly explore different combinations. Okay, in the interest of time, let me stop here and there's a few more minutes so I can take some questions. Uh, so we closely work with industry. So some of the industry partners and collaborators are down here. Um, and let me stop here and, uh, and answer some of your questions.